good afternoon and welcome to the Federal Executive Forum celebrating 18 years of profiling excellence in government IT mission programs. I'm Luke McCormack. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing government and industry leaders with their 5G strategy, technologies, and solutions. With me on today's show are Rob Butel, Deputy Chief Technology Officer, U.S. Air Force, Dr. Thomas Osborne, Executive Director, VA Convergence Center, Department of Veterans Affairs, David Ariola, Deputy of Operations for the National Center for Collaborative Healthcare Innovation, Department of Veterans Affairs, Kevin Gallo, Director, Technical Account Management, GSA's Office of Information Technology category. Brian Greenberg, Principal Government and Public Sector, Deloitte Consulting. Brian Shromsky, Manager Partner, 5G Public Sector, Verizon Business Group. And Mike Loomis, General Manager, Nokia Federal Solutions. Well, we are talking 5G and we're talking about all the capabilities and use cases that we can enable with 5G. It's been around now for several years and it's uh, being fully adopted. Rob, we're going to start with you at U.S. Air Force. Give us the state of the state of where you all are in the use of 5G. Yeah, so uh, with 5G, we're really making an effort to bring the capability to each of our installations, especially within the uh, continental United States, but even even uh, you know outside the continental United States. So there's a major focus just having the capability there to take advantage of. Um, a lot of our programs are realizing the benefits and are starting to approach uh, acquiring 5G for specific use cases. Um, a, a lot of it is too, is to fully take advantage of 5G. We have other efforts such as our zero trust effort and a lot of those along those lines that will allow us to fully take advantage of the commercial 5G capability so that we're not reliant on, five, on private 5G networks, which create uh, additional stovepipes and additional expense that we'd like to try to avoid. So uh, we're really laying the foundation. Uh, the next couple of years are gonna be really interesting. You're gonna really see some significant moves forward and uh, um, really look forward to see where we end up. Hats off to the major carriers as well for, for propagating 5G out there and making it uh, ubiquitous and, and available uh, across the nation, across the world, quite frankly. Dr. Osborne, I know that you all are doing an incredible amount of very interesting things in regarding 5G, sort of plowing the path there in healthcare. Give us the state of the state of where you all are in the use of the adoption of 5G. Thank you so much, Luke. It's great to be here first and among so many amazing people on the call. So really, our team's mission, our purpose is to provide the best, most advanced healthcare possible for our veterans and to really lean forward. And so a little over three years ago, we became the first 5G VA. And we've been building on that. And now we got full spectrum capabilities, mid band, high band, low band. And we've been, at the same time we've been building the infrastructure, we've been working on these different use cases, some really exciting stuff. We've been using advanced augmented reality for all kinds of things like holographic teaching and training and working on pre-surgical planning and as all kinds of other things like working towards using this for things like 3D X-ray vision, where you can actually use this system to navigate when you're doing surgeries and really see what you're doing. We're doing some other stuff. We got this really advanced drone program that's enabled with 5G. And we've done this other thing that's just amazing. We've done something we're calling holographic teleportation, where you can take someone, a three-dimensional capture of them from one room and virtually teleport them into another room, which has a lot of great implications for healthcare. Wow. I mean, it, it, it almost sounds like Star Trek and you sound like quite the engineer as a physician. So that's impressive as well. David, would you like to add anything in regards to the uh, the overall state of the state for 5G and VA? Dr. Osborne, it's a hard act to follow. Uh, I got to admit, he covered it very well. And I think that's exactly where we're at. And it's very exciting. Uh, super impressive. The, the capabilities that 5G is really unlocking and you all are really taking advantage of that. So I'm sure every veteran out there certainly appreciates that. Kevin, how about at the GA, GSA's Office of Innovation Technology? Let's explain what that is first and then tell us what you're doing in regards to 5G. 
Uh, hello. Yes. My, my office, what we do is we provide the marketplace for the government to meet its enterprise IT and telecommunications mm -hmm. needs. You know, so the programs and contracts we manage provide virtually every type of service to the federal, state, and local governments. Uh, you know, on the telecom side, you know, almost every department and agency relies on these contracts for the voice and data lines, parts of the underlying infrastructure, network security, you know, and, and then the ancillary services to manage it all. And so in this portfolio, it's also the largest government program for commercial cellular service. Um, you know, it was used to purchase almost $900 million of wireless services, you know, the past year. So in managing this portfolio, you know, we try to keep current with the technology, the use cases, a few of them we just heard about for, uh, for, for, for 5G, you know, the challenges, the marketplace, and then we use that knowledge to make it easier for agencies to procure their needed services. You know, 5G is one of our top technology focus areas. You know, so regarding 5G, we've done a few things here recently on the acquisition front. We've revamped and expanded our wireless mobility solutions multiple award schedule, you know, define new subcategories, and we're adding providers and services. We've also updated the mobility services, including those related to 5G under the Enterprise Infrastructure Solutions Contract, or EIS. That's our broad scope contract vehicle for enterprise networking services, it includes everything, the wireless, wireline, managed services, security services, cloud, and other infrastructure. And we, earlier this year, we published the acquisition guidance to procure 5G technology. Mm -hmm. So that was an outgrowth out of our role with the national strategy to secure 5G. And it really was a team effort. You know, we had led that, but we had also involved a number of other federal agencies with that, you know, we had input and collaboration with industry. And really what that, what that is, that's a, you know, a plain language primer on how to structure secure 5G deployments. Um, and, you know, another thing we had done with that is leveraging the Federal Mobility Group or the FMG. So that's another one of our main activities there. The FMG, that's a community of practice, you know, focused on the mobility space, challenges, opportunities for the federal government. 5G, which is a major one of that. And we're one of the co-chairs for that group, along with the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency and uh, NIST. So 5G has been very active in hosting webinars and outreach and uh, just collaboration among government agencies and industry. Such an important technology and such an important service that you uh, provide there. Uh, you know, uh, you've got these agencies that want to unlock these capabilities and they certainly don't want to spend all their energy trying to figure out how to acquire it. So we do really do appreciate you uh, making that uh, much simpler, much more straightforward. Brian at Deloitte Consulting. Um, Deloitte certainly doesn't create or invent 5G, but you certainly do create and invent and deliver 5G solutions. Tell us about sort of the state of the state from where you sit in regards to 5G. Luke, I'll be honest. I'm still a little stuck on the tele, the teleporting. I'm, I'm hoping that Dr. Osborne can play the board for all of us. It was making my head spin too. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. And, and like everybody else, great to be here uh, amongst a lot of phenomenal folks, government, industry, uh, and great to see many of you that I, I know quite well. Uh, first, in terms of, I think, to build on your point, Luke, the role that Deloitte plays so we look at it from an end-to-end -end perspective, mm -hmm. um, and that's from our advisory to the implementation, and that's from a private 5G perspective, neutral host, obviously working with our mobile network operator uh, colleagues, such as Brian here with Verizon, you know, in terms of more of the public deployments. Mm -hmm. We very much take it from a business and a mission outcome lens, honestly, you know, and, and 5G is in my title, uh, but I am a big proponent of Wi-Fi 6, certainly look at things from a non-terrestrial and want to make sure we are helping our clients and ourselves, quite frankly, bring a holistic perspective and use all the tools in the toolkit. Uh, I think as everyone on this phone uh, will tell you in this phone call, uh, 5G is complementary. Um, and a lot of us are also heavily benefiting and leveraging edge computing as well. Now, our big focus is a lot of the integration and the stitching together. And that's not just from a, a tech perspective, but that's also the workflow, that's the workforce, uh, and, and truly trying to make sure, again, it's, we're taking a holistic perspective and, again, using all the tech tools. Um, and we're doing that across the U.S. government, uh, particularly with a heavy focus to no surprise on defense and health. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also doing it commercially. Um, and I'm hoping to speak to, on that a little later here today and then globally as well. 
Now, in, in terms of the progress, state of affairs, I'm sure like everyone on this call, it has been a whirlwind, albeit I, I would say we'd probably all say it's been a whirlwind for a number of years. Uh, and a lot of activity across a multitude of domains. Um, for us, that's been heavy, as I mentioned, with defense and health, but particularly around logistics, to no surprise. And I think everyone on this call is probably playing in that realm to some degree. Also around critical infrastructure protection. Um, and not just, again, the network, but what are you layering on top of that from an application perspective? Um, mm -hmm. And Dr. Osborne talked about the UAS, UAS, counter UAS, obviously being a big focus. We've also helped build some field hospitals, which has been fascinating, uh, challenging all at the same time, you know, and all that done in a you know, super fast manner, you know, in the matter of days, weeks, not months, years. And then we, I think slightly different from a lot of those on the call today, we have played a lot in helping to get the large scale investment that the U.S. government has put out around digital equity, around tech innovation. We've, we've helped a number of clients with that. And then lastly, around cross government uh, from a cyber perspective has been a big focus, um, obviously, with particular nations that have been involved in that regard. And then lastly, been playing a lot with um, testing, a lot with playing and trying to look at it not only from an office perspective, which is, is critical. We all obviously work in some degree of an office, even you know, balancing it from a home perspective. But also, what does that mean in a real warehouse? What does that mean on the airfield? Um, and that's been a big focus of ours with a lot of progress and, and frankly, a lot of partnerships across you know, everyone on this call and, and many others that you know, are with us today. So a lot happening, but again, no no teleporting just yet, at least for me. I got, I got gotcha. you, and a lot of a lot of really fascinating use cases there, uh, Brian Shromsky. Um, uh, you know, as as I had stated, that there there there's some companies that are not uh, developing five G, but you saw you all two years ago when we had this conversation uh, it was like five G is almost a gleam in everyone's eye. Now it's just out there uh, completely. Uh, deploy. We really do appreciate that, listening to these different use cases. Tell us about the state of the state from where you all stand. Well, thank you, Luke, uh, for the opportunity to meet with everybody on here again. Um, and it is just going extremely well. I mean, we're very pleased where we are today in, in terms of our state, of our network, in terms of 5G. Uh, we're continuously rolling out our mid-band spectrum, our C-band spectrum, which for us is a $60 billion investment for us, right? So it's huge. It is the future of our company, if you will. Um, and most importantly, I think to your point, you know, we launched 5G four years ago. It was April 2019, right? It was only two markets. It was on high band, right? It wasn't a very big, large coverage area. And to hear the other panelists here talk about anywhere from drone technology, what the Air Force is doing, but also acquisition, right, that Kevin brought up, right? So now, four years in, right, where you have the network started to deploy that what Verizon is doing, we have the GSA that's putting the contract vehicles in place, but more importantly, it's actually the use cases, right? They're actually driving demand. And I think the thing that, as we've talked in the past, most recently last week, is you know the ecosystem's catching up, right? The device manufacturers, in terms of those end user devices, are finally going beyond smartphones, right? I think that at any generation of technology we've seen, it starts what you what you actually carry, right? Think a tablet, think a smartphone, right? But getting into more industrial IoT that enables drone technology, that enables AR, VR, right, connected flight lines that Rob mentioned as well. Now we're finally seeing that actually happen. Probably a little delayed, obviously, with the pandemic and the semiconductor shortage. But also there's other things too, right? We were doing a huge migration. We, you know, us as well as the other carriers are shutting down the 3G network. That just happened at the end of 2022, right? So we are all in, obviously, on 5G four years in. But make no bones about it. We are starting to plan for 6G, the plan is seed out there, right? This technology always evolves. And most importantly, we need to make sure that we have a strong foundation, being a U.S.-based customer, uh, based carrier, if you will. Uh, it takes near and dear to us, right? So it's nice to hear zero trust architecture. We're probably hearing in the last six months, the last year, a lot more scrutiny around supply chain and actually um, you know, security, not just at a cyber level, but from a physical layer. So it's nice to have partners like Nokia that you're going to hear from as well. And obviously from consulting services that we work strongly with Deloitte. So rest assured, we're all in on 5G and putting our money where our mouth is, but I couldn't be more excited to hear really about the use cases. And more importantly, what Kevin brought out that over gets overlooked a lot, right? 
it's great that you have this network, you have these use cases, but if you can't acquire through a contract vehicle, it doesn't do anything for anybody. A, a, amen on that one. And we really do appreciate everything that uh, Verizon is doing to make this capability available to all these agencies. Uh, Mike, over at Nokia, you all are uh, are uh, right smack in the middle of this 5G revolution, so to speak. And we thank you for that. Give us the state of the state from where you all stand. Uh, thanks, Luke. So, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, as Nokia, we're a technology uh, provider of right. uh, 5G. Um, we work primarily with our MNO partners like Brian um, to deliver a 5G capability that they, they can deploy. Or we deliver the technology to deploy a 5G capability. Um, and we're well in it. You know, um, you know, as Brian mentioned, it, it's we're deep in it with uh, our MNO partners. And what we're excited to see is this move over into other verticals. Uh, we've eclipsed our 118th private um, enterprise 5G deployment. Many of wow. those are, are with Verizon. And some of them are pretty cool logos. I just... And I I didn't confirm. I would have liked to have shared some, but I'm just not sure which are public yet. But some of the logos that, particularly the ones we've earned with Verizon, are um, uh, really great logos to have. Um, in the federal space, of course, um, our marquee deployment is uh, with Hill Air Force Base Tranche One OUSD um, dynamic spectrum sharing. Um, we're We've been involved as a subcontractor in a number of the other uh, OUSD experiments and directly engaged um, with a number of federal agencies on deployments that have gone outside that experimentation funding. And that's really great to see, um, you know, operational deployments out there. And one of those operational deployments, um, we took a first call 5G SA network in January of 2022. Um, it you know those deployments are maturing, so you know we're deep in that and uh, really focused on execution. And and that's fantastic. And and uh, 118, that's really impressive on the uh, on the private 5G rollout. You're hearing that more and more, and uh, I'm I'm thrilled because uh, that means there's 118 use cases out there uh, where this fantastic technology is uh, becoming available. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on the Federal News Network. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about 5G and we're getting into specific use cases. Uh, VA top line, some fascinating capability that they're using to unlock um, in regards to the use of 5G. David, I'm going to ask you specific uh, use case, one or two, where you're using 5G to sort of unlock some of these uh, capabilities for the veterans. Sure. Uh, so I, I think I'll start with uh, something Dr. Osborne had already mentioned, which would be uh, surgical AR or augmented mm -hmm. reality. Uh, we're able to leverage a HoloLens device, uh, which if you're not familiar with that, it's a head-mounted display where mm -hmm. it displays holographic images. Uh, now, Surgical AR, uh, developed by a company called Metavis, will take CT scans, render this into a 3D image, and allow you to place that or register it onto a patient for multiple use cases such as um, surgical planning. Now, one of the ways we're able to use 5G to leverage uh, that technology is CT scans, images such as, as such require a huge amount of bandwidth. Uh, leveraging high band millimeter wave uh, technology to stream that, that image to the headset with low latency is required, right? You, you need that type of connection. Otherwise you will have uh, just jitter and kind of a, you know, a flickery hologram that just would not really um, do for, for that use case. So we've been able to leverage a um, edge computing uh, remote render that image and stream it to a HoloLens over a 5G connection. The ability to do that was um, 
quite a heavy lift, uh, believe it or not. You would think all you would need is the bandwidth uh, or the low latency connection, but there's many other aspects. Aside from optimizing the application to function in that manner, which isn't standard currently. I mean, this is, this is cutting edge stuff. You need to optimize the radio frequencies per that application just to ensure the stability of the hologram. Mm. So, you know, aspects such as that were, you know, fascinating. And, um, and you know, it's one of our use cases. Uh, another use case to elaborate on is our drone our drone program. We're currently testing that with the police department here at VA Palo Alto, and we're leveraging a streaming platform that will allow the, um, the drone to stream video in uh, live through the 5G connection and reach multiple endpoints and um, with you know, high speed clarity, high definition video. So that aspect of it is, is very exciting as well because not only can the controller of the drone view video, but now anybody from executive leadership team to a police chief to folks on the ground can now tap into the same streaming um, feed and, and uh, monitor the situation. So uh, those two uh, use cases, I think, are, are the top of my list right now to kind of and, 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 and both of them very fascinating. I would imagine that first one is just such a fine grain, precise type of capability that you have to have there. Uh, so I, I can appreciate the fact that everything has to be very finely tuned in order to to make that work on such an important thing as to, you know, sort of patient's health there. Dr. Osborne, would you like to add anything? Oh, thanks. Thanks, Luke. Uh, David did a great job. And, uh, you know, David's on our team, does such amazing work pulling all the tech together behind the scenes. But I'll add a little bit to what he, uh, David already mentioned, and then I'll bring up a, another topic. So uh, when it comes to using the system that you just talked about, Luke, it's really important to make sure it's registered correctly. So imagine, you know, I happen to be a neuroradiologist. And so if I'm looking at a CT scan or an MRI scan, it comes over on a PAC system, a computer system in two dimensions, you know, slices, almost like, like a, a bread, a loaf of bread would be sliced. And looking at that is not very intuitive for most people unless they've done this for decades. But we can take those two-dimensional images and we can transform them into a three-dimensional hologram. So now it's intuitive, right? Now you're looking at it in a way that's sort of like more of what you would approach a patient in front of you. And then you can look at it at any angle. You can, you can dive into it. You can see the anatomy from any angle. You can, you can approach it and, and figure out what's the, the shortest path to the target and the path of, of less risk where you can avoid critical structures and get to the problem in the safest way possible. So that's just like pretty cool if you're thinking about pre-surgical planning. But once you've done that and once you're able to register with the advanced equipment that we have and the 5G allowing us to move a lot of that data around effectively, then you can actually put that hologram of someone's own CT scan on top of their body. And when it's registered correctly, like you're saying, Luke, when you register it accurately, then you can actually have three-dimensional x-ray vision. You can lean in and look into somebody. You can change the opacity and you can see both what it would look like with some of the deep anatomy visualized while you're seeing actual the, the real physical body in front of you. So it's pretty amazing just to be able to sort of understand what's going on in real time. But once you have that, then you can use that to actually guide procedures. And so we've been doing a lot of work in the lab in like these devices called phantoms, which are, you know, r realistic uh, representations of people. And the level of accuracy that we have uh, achieved is beyond FDA standards. So the potential that we have is tremendous to transform how we provide care from going from a place where we did procedures blind, where you just sort of going for it and hoping for the best, to having precise localization on the order of millimeters to provide better care where people have a smaller incision, where they have faster recovery because there's less complications. So it's a real win-win. So that's very exciting for us. Wow. Uh, the other part, go ahead. No, no, please. It's just, it just, it's making my, my head explode listening to this. It's just super impressive. It's so cool. And the other thing that's about that that's really amazing is Okay, say for instance, you were, um, I don't know, say Luke, you're a surgeon in a remote rural area 
and you see a case and you're like, oh my gosh, this is a domain that is a little out of my scope. I'm just not sure. I would love to consult someone, but you're the only surgeon there. Wouldn't it be great if someone from another place, uh, you know, from a major university from the other side of the country could come in and give you advice, see exactly what you're seeing to point out like, hey, it's this thing with a holographic overlay and not that thing that you want to get. So we're working on that as well. And so this sort of touches a little bit to what we talked about earlier with the holographic teleportation, which is the ability to, to have these interactions at a distance where people can be physically in different locations, but virtually in the same place. And I can talk about that for a long time, but there's so yeah, much. Yeah, and essentially almost uh, zero latency there, which uh, which is what uh, 5G is all about. So just fascinating use cases. Brian from Deloitte, uh, let's talk about a specific program that you'd like to highlight in regards to something that you're working on across the federal sector. Well, Luke, I'm actually going to change it on you for a moment because I, I I think we're going to talk a, a lot about the, the federal sector. And I mentioned that you know, we are so obviously supporting a number of clients, again, particularly in the defense Absolutely. and the health space. Give, a, give, uh, give us a private sector example. Currently sitting here in, uh, in San Jose, uh, top of mind, but we recently announced an effort with Meta and on their campuses out here in California. Mm-hmm. Um, and I alluded to this a little earlier with regards to the neutral host model. Um, and this was a collaboration with Shared Spectrum. Uh, and I know everybody on this phone, I think, understands the, the model around neutral host or federated networks, but it, it put the ownership you know, back with Meta uh, and had a, a, a shared infrastructure that particularly the, the big three uh, MNOs, including Verizon, were able to leverage. And that you know, leveraged and brought in using the, the MOCAN or the multi-operator core network, obviously, approach. Uh, what was really cool about it was Greater control and flexibility. I think you could you could quickly argue for Meta, uh, particularly in obviously in this year, you know, challenging financial times. So it gave them a lot more flex as to how to play things out, particularly in a hybrid model. It also for the MNOs provided greater coverage and greater customer experience, uh, along with obviously the employee experience as as you get into their respective campus locations. Um, and then on the operational side, a much faster time to deploy uh, to upwards of 75%, and then obviously savings. And then with all of that, and again, this is one part of their larger connectivity strategy, um, and certainly other forms of, of tech involved. But again, the impact was, was sizable, um, and they're looking at possibly leveraging this approach for a lot of their other campuses. So we'll see how much, if at all, that plays out into the government side, but I think pretty ex- exciting stuff. Uh, commercial that I think has a lot of uh, possibilities on a much larger scale. Very, very exciting. And thank you for that example. Rob, let's talk about use cases at the U.S. Air Force. I'm hearing flight lines. I'm hearing all kinds of different things. I know there's a variety of activities going on there. Give us an example. Yeah, and so actually the flight lines where I'm going to go to. So uh, ah, okay. in, in cooperation with the uh, Office of Secretary of Defense, uh, Research and Engineering, and the Navy out at uh, on the island of Oahu, it's a horrible place to have to go. Mm-hmm. But uh, out there, we are doing a uh, a flight line effort where um, bringing 5G in, and it's kind of a full spectrum of capabilities it's enabling. So it's everything from as simple as um, as a platform is coming in to land being able to get maintenance data immediately off so that it's a, a matter where you already know uh, uh, issues that are potentially coming on, uh, being able to have spares in place, all these things. So ultimately our our readiness of aircraft, uh, we've already seen some improvements and we expect it to be a, a tremendous force enabler. Um, beyond that, it's the ability, you know, we talked about UAS earlier. It's beyond that to use UASs and other sensors to be able to do surveys of aircraft as they come in looking for issues before they've even gotten into the hangar. So uh, almost in real time, being able to find stuff. Um, and so it's not just a uh, force enabler, not just an ability to save money, but it's also a flight safety uh, issue to where we could start finding uh, issues with aircraft long before we would normally uh normally realize it and then the scenario that to me is uh it it seems almost trivial to some folks but it's huge and it's the idea of thought foreign object debris 
So one of the greatest enemies of aircraft are birds or anything out there on the flight line. And the way that we do that today is pretty much it's people go out and drive the flight line and look for stuff. Well, yeah. you know what? Birds don't cooperate. It's almost like they're watching us. All right, as soon as you moved on, now it's time for me to move in. And people don't understand the damage that a single bird could do to an aircraft. It is significant. So now being able to put sensors in place to where not only can we sense it, but possibly you'd have the ability to chase some of these things away um, it is huge. Now, they've done some very initial testing with this, uh, and there's just a whole lot more to come. So, I mean, it's a, a whole plethora of things that we're realizing every, everywhere from maintenance readiness all the way up to something um, as uh, simple as the foreign object debris use case. And which is super important from a safety perspective. So I really do Absolutely. appreciate that. Mike, how about at Nokia? Again, I know you sort of described you, you all are sort of the, the, uh, the hardware and technology that's being put into these solutions. But no doubt you have a couple of uh, at least one good example use case that you'd like to share. We touch a lot of use cases, and it's really fascinating to um, get to see some of these use cases firsthand. And there are quite a few uh, I could talk about. I'll talk about one that I give, find. Give me, give me your top one. Yeah, one I find uh, particularly fascinating and interesting for me uh, as a uh, Army veteran and alumni of the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, we're investing uh, very heavily in tactical situational awareness and uh, working with partners to package uh, 5G wireless broadband uh, with edge computing, uh, situational awareness applications and uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, to bring together um, a, a solution we call Banshee, uh, which provides tactical uh, situational awareness. Uh, it helps um, folks on the ground uh, gather information, um, distill that information, make decisions, and then distribute it back out in an intelligent way. Uh, and you know anything we can do to help uh, folks in the tactical environment make better decisions faster, uh, we think is is a really good thing. And um, I, I found that project uh, particularly exciting. Very important project as well. Uh, Kevin, you are kind of sitting in the catbird seat there, right? You've got a, a, a visibility across all these departments and agencies. Give us an example of where you're uh, unlocking and enabling this 5G capability for these agencies. Yeah, well, 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 that's exactly right. You know, with our role in government, working across the agencies, working with industry, with multiple providers in, in the industry, and, and then with the Federal Mobility Group, you know, we're always listening to and learning from others' use cases, best practices. This is both from government agencies and commercial enterprises. So I'm just listening to the ones today. You know, I mean, the really fascinating things going on with you know, telemedicine there and the virtual surgery and the, uh, the holographic teleportation and, or, or the examples with the Air Force there and, and you know, and flight line and the FOD, you know, my, my background's in, in naval aviation too. So I could definitely relate to that and, uh, and see the tremendous value and potential that's, uh, that's there, you know, so we're always learning from these use cases and then we're adding our expertise regarding enterprise networking and government acquisition. So we brought a lot of this together in the 5G acquisition guidance, you know, that we have published earlier this year, you know, that's designed to be able to help set up an agency for successful 5G implementation. You know, it identifies the standards, security controls, and other requirements to provide a secure infrastructure for 5G enabled technologies. Um, it covers the acquisition process, of, uh, of course, but we also note 5G specific architectural and performance requirements. You know, these could include the requirements for user equipment, radio access network, you know, 5G core, various components of the 5G infrastructure, um, and just some of the ones that were mentioned by the, uh, the uh, you know, the earlier speakers here, you know, it's like the, the radio performance and the spectrum utilization pieces. And a big part of those requirements is the security aspect. You know, that's the major consideration for any IT acquisition, you know, and including the you know, appropriate requirements, especially when it comes to 5G, we're also concerned about supply chain risk management, avoiding the prohibited sources that were specified by the Section 889 of the National Defense Authorization Act there. So that's, the, you know, it mentions that and provides the guide for that 
And then lastly, you know, mention the best in class contracts. Yeah, and no, and no question that the level of sophistication that you need to pull something like this off, particularly I'm thinking about the private 5G networks, uh, I'm sure the guidance that you all are providing is instrumental in, in allowing them a, a great acquisition experience, let's call it. Brian over at Verizon, give us one example of a program that you'd like to highlight. So uh, we heard some great youth cases, right? Um, obviously, our work with the VA, with David and Dr. Osborne, right? As Rob mentioned, some of the work that we're doing. And two things I want to note here, right? Uh, we're very actively uh, working with the 5G cross-functional team with DOD under now the CIO shop. And Kevin brought up another very good group that we've also participated as a federal mobility group with GSA, right? So Suru and that team there has done a great job of actually reaching out to industry, not just Verizon, but the other carriers out there. Because as we all know, it does take a lot of people, a lot of knowledge to actually make this a reality. In terms of use cases here, I'll go more into meat and potatoes that Kevin will probably be excited about is you know, we're talking about broadband access, right? So when I talk about 5G, not just all the use cases that we're talking about here, but just the bread and butter, meaning that it is fixed wireless access, right? So you'll hear a lot on the DOD side, right? From base modernization, right? Uh, you'll hear on the civilian side, the business transformation, right? Do so you have legacy services on legacy contracts like networks as we migrate to EIS, right? We found, we were fortunate enough here, I'm on based on the East Coast, some of us are on the West Coast, but there's a lot of places in the United States that do not have adequate access to broadband technology, right, and can get smile connectivity. And that's one of the biggest growth engines we have right now for 5G that's horizontal, both in the DOD space and civilian, where we're providing last mile connectivity to, for instance, a commissary on a military installation. Right now, we are monitoring water, seismic activity, radioactive material, um, precipitation. Right now we're doing some work with civilian agencies monitoring the snow cap. Why that's so important? Because we need to know how much snow is. We prepare for fire season that's already outbroke uh, right now in Canada. And there's actually some outbreaks right now in New Mexico and some other Western states right now. So actually we get very excited about things like fixed wireless access for 5G. I know it enables a lot of these use cases you're talking about here, but Make no bones about it. Connectivity is still king, and broadband is sorely needed in a lot of areas, and 5G is going to bridge the gap because a lot of legacy copper services will not be carried over to this next generation contracts and technology, and then cellular is finally a reliable option um, to be used by federal agencies. Well, we, you really bring up some great points, and we really do appreciate that. Uh, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We are talking about 5G. We're having a fantastic conversation. We're going to talk about priorities. Number one priority for the VA in regards to the 5G implementation or the use cases of Dr. Osborne, please. Thanks, Luke. Uh, great question. So we've got a bunch of priorities. We have uh, our sort of shop is set up as an incubator. And so we develop mm -hmm. and deploy new technologies. And so we've done a lot of the infrastructure that we've talked about. And we've built a lot of the foundation uh, for some pretty amazing tech that we've discussed. And so the next phase in the short term is to start to utilize these tools in a translational way to bring them from the bench to the bedside. So for example, we talked about this really cool thing called holoportation, this holographic holoportation. And so we are planning to bring this to patients who are isolated in say an ICU room. Imagine someone with COVID who, you know, no one can go in to see them. It's really isolating. Wouldn't it be amazing if you can holographically teleport family and friends and caregivers into that room? So that's our next short-term goal. Uh, we talked about surgical guidance with using uh, advanced augmented reality. So we have done a lot of the lab work to prove that this works. The next phase is to work for the FDA 510K to make it possible to use this in clinical care. And then the last thing that I think is a priority, at least in the short term, is our drone program is is really uh, what a lot of people were talking about earlier about you know situational and operational awareness. You know, a hospital 
and our facility is a big facility and all kinds of things can happen. You have, you know, floods, fires, leaks, you know, you have patients that are uh, elopement. And so having an eye in the sky with advanced technology that allows you to have real time situational and operational awareness is super important. And so we are currently doing a lot of testing to show that this works and we're optimizing those processes and those standard operating procedures with our police department who are fantastic and super engaged. So we're doing that in our facility, in our sort of local area, and we're packaging that up so all these other VAs across the country who are interested in it can benefit from the work and continue to expand all the benefits. So those are the big goals for us in the short and term. And love that incubation technique. And uh, yes, these uh, these VA centers are absolutely huge. So uh, interesting use case there. Mike at Nokia, top priority for you all at this point in regards to 5G, what's the demand signal out there? We're involved in an awful lot of projects right now. Uh, you know, some deployment, some testing, some use case evaluation. And my number one priority uh, to the team is execution, uh, because if folks don't have a good experience in uh, those engagements, then they're not going to continue on with the technology. So that's far and away because we had a lot on our plate. Um, our second priority is partnering uh, and developing partnerships with um, the right companies, like like the deep partnership we have with Verizon that mm -hmm. that um, uh, Brian talked a little bit about. Um, our customers or the consumers of 5G are not buying our tech per se for the sake of our tech. They're buying it for a capability. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we need to package our technology uh, with an operator, with the right applications, and other components in the ecosystem to deliver the capability that they're looking to get out of it. And, and that's how we'll be successful as a technology provider. Um, our third priority is bringing in new capabilities into uh, 5G and so we can get to that next set of use cases. And um, early in the program, we talked a little bit about uh, non-terrestrial networks. Uh, we're very excited about that uh, area as well as Cislunar. We have a lot of experience in NTN with um, a couple of live deployments. Recently, we publicly announced with AST Mobile. But the big one is uh, coming up in the fall, uh, we were awarded the 4G tipping point with NASA to put private cellular uh, on the lunar lander. And um, we're looking to expand, uh, you know, 3GPP uh, in a cislunar use case and evolve that into 5G over time. So we think we have a lot of demand signal for for 5G and uh, 3GPP capability in, in a um, NTN um, high altitude and cislunar use cases. Love it. Love the 5G on the uh, on the moon as well. Kevin, top priority for GSA this year. Yeah, our, our top priority is to continue to work with federal agencies and specifically agencies often come to us to discuss their enterprise wireless needs or enterprise networking needs. You know, and one of the big activities with which we've been busy is assisting agencies in transition their enterprise networks and other services to enterprise infrastructure solutions or the EIS contracts. Mm -hmm. you know, and with this transition, you know, we're seeing that agencies are beginning to implement SD-WAN or software defined wide area networking. Um, and, you know, and while this is not a wireless technology per se, it definitely impacts wireless and 5G. You know, we anticipate the adoption of SD-WAN to increase significantly, you know, in the next few years. And it, it can be an aspect of a 5G solution, a significant aspect. You know, you know for example, one of SD-WAN's fundamental capabilities is to manage multiple network connection links, you know, enabling mm -hmm. link diversity. You know, so this is going to increase the adoption of 5G fixed wireless access, you know, which is one of the basic 5G use cases. You know, with a fixed wireless access, it can be installed quickly. You know, sometimes it would be employed as a temporary measure, you know, until fiber can be installed, you know, or maybe for a scenario such as disaster response. You know, other times it'll be a permanent secondary or back, backup um, wide area networking link, you know, maybe mm -hmm. even the, the primary link for certain remote, small remote areas. You know, so there's one example. Another example, SD-WAN could be an important part of a backhaul for 5G stations. I mean, that's exactly what the carriers are doing. 
You know, we mentioned security briefly, you know, SD-WAN that supports zero trust and is a major part of the zero trust architecture. You know, so in general, as agencies implement more, more modern enterprise networks, we see that as a launch pad for the further modernization, you know, and as a platform to realize, you know, some of the you know, exciting use cases that we've been, uh, we've been hearing about today. A lot of great use cases and people think 5G, they think mobile and certainly the fixed wire, very important piece of that uh, uh, element. Brian, how about at uh, Verizon? Top priority for you all this year. Philosophy. We got to move. We got to move fast, right? So I, I think this is a very important year going into the second half of 2023. As you heard, right? A lot of R and D, a lot of development, a lot of proving out things, right? And what our big priority is: how do we move from the R and D aspect to more operational, right? How do we get speed? How do we get greater adoption out there? By no make no bones about it, right? We're not skirting over security and concerns that everybody's mentioned here, but in some cases. You can get into a paralysis state, right? That you know that transition from R and D to operational can lag, right? So it's nice to hear Kevin, as you mentioned, SD WAN. One of the things we're working a lot on some of the civilian agencies where we have actually tested in the field 5G with SD WAN, which coupled with fixed wireless access. So our for all focus is now that the network and we're rushing, not rushing, but building out the network to meet the demand, if you will, on the mid band with our C band deployment, which will wrap up at the end of 2023. We're very excited about and really having that acquisition strategy that gets solely overlooked, but more importantly, those use cases and, you know, taking the great work that Dr. Osborne and David has done in Palo Alto, how do we replicate that across all the VA installations, right? Not just that one or also globally, right? So that's what I mean by scale and velocity is how quickly can we do this in a safe, uh, controlled manner, but not to be hamstrung by Okay, that transition period going from R and D uh, to an operational, but in some cases, some people do it very well. In some cases, it only starts, stops, starts and stops in R and D and doesn't transition to operational. So, and we really, priority. And we really appreciate the uh, the swiftness on the rollout schedule there, Rob. U.S. Air Force top priority for you. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it's uh, uh, there's two aspects to it that kind of piggybacks off what we've just been talking about very well. So one is coverage. So um, this is an issue we've had even back into the LTE days. So uh, the commercial providers do a great job in the commercial centers getting stuff in, but our bases are large and don't always have the ability to have coverage from uh, the external base. So major effort working with the commercial providers to bring that coverage to the bases to get so that we have it there. And then the second aspect is actually getting the capabilities in the user's hands. Because one of the things we're running into, and this is kind of to Brian's point about uh, getting the R&E experiment efforts actually operational, just because the capabilities there, people don't necessarily understand they have a requirement for it. It's, and so getting it in their hands, getting them to understand what is possible, now they'll start understanding what their actual requirements are as we move out. And so I think all of that will start snowballing and start tr creating tremendous velocity over the next couple of years. Uh, it'll be interesting to have this conversation two years from now. Uh, right, from it, was a, it, was a, it was a gleam in someone's eye two years ago. Very practical implementation. We're expecting wide scale rollout uh, two years from now, but we'll hold you to that or we'll hold the carriers to that. Brian, Deloitte Consulting, top priority. Shame on you, Luke. You know, consultants can't think in single things. We have to think in threes. But, uh, you know, I, I would say let's, first. Let's try yeah, our best for one. Well, well, what I would say is let's tackle the big, boring problems. Um, and it's not mutually exclusive. Uh, so the things that everybody has talked about have huge ancillary benefits. So think about audit readiness, when you can actually go find everything, and these are not trivial things, amount to obviously huge production challenges and hopefully over time benefits, you know, leveraging this technology uh, and the benefits obviously to all of the OT and hopefully all this brings OT, IT, cyber together. Um, the world's going to move a lot faster um, for all of us. And again, I hope for that creates you know, more, more partnerships. And if I may, just quickly building on it, um, there's a lot of talk about AI. There's a lot of talk about ESG. There's, again, a lot of talk about cyber. There's a lot of talk about space. These things are not mutually exclusive. 
So I think, again, bringing them together, and I think ideally creating a series of simple buttons for a lot of our colleagues and customers is a big focus of ours. And I, th I think probably most of the folks on the, on the call here, if not all. And we really do appreciate that. Uh, um, you know, sticking with the basics is really important. But we're going to have to wrap it up. This has been a fantastic show. But we always like to conclude with uh, the, the, the question about painting a picture of the future. Mike, we're going to start with you at Nokia. So, to, you know, what, what's coming out of the pitch, Petri dish? What can we expect to see in regards to this capability over the next couple of years? So uh, I spend a lot of time up at Bell Labs and uh, the Nokia Bell Labs folks are, are teaching me what's coming next. And um, they're working on a lot of cool things for um, uh, 6G and the upcoming uh, 3GPP uh, standards releases. One cool prototype that we've got uh, up there that we like to show is a sensing capability where, uh, you know, a, a candidate for one of the capabilities of 6G is uh, using the 6G network as a sensor. And um, I think that has a lot of applicability across uh, federal use cases, enterprise use cases. And uh, it's a it's a great demo. And uh, if, if folks are interested in seeing it, I'd be happy to escort you up to Bell Labs and, and you can see it for yourself. So that, that's a, an a exciting area that we think holds promise in the, uh, not in the near term, but in the, you know, in the years to come. Fantastic. We really do appreciate that. Brian at Verizon Business. I'll give you a near term one. We're very excited about some of the capabilities around network slicing on the commercial network, right? So that's something that we're we're excited for that you're going to see very soon from us in the near term. And then obviously being prepared for the future 3GPP releases and obviously working with acquisition and these fine individuals here on their use cases. But I would say Near term, I'm very excited about some of the things that we're going to do with network slicing, which I think will enable, as Rob mentioned, operating through a commercial carrier and some of the advanced security we're looking to do with slicing. Appreciate that. Brian at Deloitte Consulting, one minute future. What does it look like two to three years from now? Yeah, Luke, I'm, I'm going to change it on you uh, just because I think it's important. I think a lot of folks have already touched upon on the, the future of the tech or the evolution. But to me, I think uh, just kind of table panel what I mentioned a bit earlier of I would just encourage everyone to make 5G, and again, a lot of us have, have coupled it with edge computing, part of your larger strategy. And that is not just for the folks in IT. That is for the agency, for the business leaders, again, to the folks on the shop floor. It, it's one and all. And then including, I think, as, as Rob mentioned, from an R&E perspective, um, and then lastly, I know we like to talk a lot about Greenfield, net new. There's a lot of brownfield out there. And what does it mean for your workflows, your legacy systems, and your workforce? You know, I think hopefully over the next few years, if not longer, that's going to be a major focus and not just a lot of talk about the, the tech standards. Really do appreciate that. Kevin, two to three years from now, EIS completely rolled out there. 5G's ubiquitous. What can we expect two to three years from now? Yeah, well, you know, right now, 5G adoption, it really is start, you know, it's, it really is still in its infancy with most mm -hmm. enterprises. You know, we're hearing about some great advances here, but it's, you know, we're just starting to see agencies buy 5G enabled uh, devices, you know, and the availability and coverage are still growing. Heard Brian mention earlier about the ecosystem, you know, is, 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 is catching up. So it's it, making big, big strides there. You know, so, you know, so some of the use cases we're hearing about now, you know, they're starting to come into focus and standalone networks or SA are, are just being deployed by some carriers, you know, and then by other things, you know, this is going to, going to enable the introduction of network slicing. And Brian and I did not compare speaker notes beforehand, but we both see the significance of this. You know, so some of the 5G capabilities, you know, such as network slicing, coupled with SD-WAN and other tech you know, technologies that's going to enable enterprises and commercial telecom providers to cost effectively roll out new services. You know, they can include managed security offer, uh, offerings, you know, it allow them to extend the managed services to home offices, mobile users, IOT devices, you know, for a number of these use cases, you know, in a government use case, for example, it could be used to backhaul the unclassified and classified voice data and video traffic, mm -hmm. you know, so really we're just, we're, we're, we're still now just seeing the launching pad 
for many of these uh, 5G use cases. Looks very promising. Dr. Osborne, you talked about a lot of fantastic advanced things there. Are we going to see robots doing surgery using 5G in two to three years or now? What can we expect? Oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, the, I'm, I'm going to give you two of the biggest things that we hope to uh, achieve in the next couple of years, and both of them have to do with edge computing. So the first is, you know, the equipment that we're using, the form factors that we have to display, for example, advanced augmented reality, they're kind of big, right? But if we can offload that processing power to the edge, to the cloud, then those form factors get really small and it opens up a ton of opportunities, uh, both for usability and for performance. Mm. So that's one. The other is clinical decision support. One of the big challenges in healthcare is there's a tremendous amount of data, more data than we can really process in you know, a typical person's day. But if we can harness that resource we can bring it together, we can process that and bring that back to the point of care in a way that's useful and timely, then we can start to really transform healthcare in, in tremendous ways. So how that would work is you take sensor data, you take all this stuff, for example, in the ICU with all the bells and whistles, combine that with EHR data, combine that with genomics and all kinds of other data streams, pull that together, have it processed in the cloud, advanced augmented, advanced artificial intelligence. We've got some great people doing that. Bring it back to the clinician at the point of care, near real time. Then you can make real informed decisions about critical situations and get the right diagnosis and the right treatment faster to patients. And that equates to better care. Sounds fantastic. And we really look forward to seeing that. Rob, take us home. U.S. Air Force, what's it going to look like two to three years now? as you're adopting this technology? So the way I see it is if, if uh, as the 5G capability comes online fully, uh, more and more uh, mature, and as we uh, use it more and more and people become used to it, it's uh, the end users gonna be heavily using it and not realize it. They're gonna have tremendous capability no matter where they're at doing what they need to do. And it's gonna be 5G or possibly other things. It could be Wi-Fi 6 or could be fiber, could be any of these things. But we mm -hmm. wanna to get to the point in time that from a user perspective, no matter where they're at, they're able to do what they need to do. And 5G is a key enabler to make that happen. And so uh, to me, it almost seems kind of counterintuitive, but my goal is to get to the point in time that 5G is so good people don't realize they have 5G. I love it. And, and Not even realize that they're, they're using the technology. We really do appreciate that. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us on this program. I'd like to thank the sponsors for supporting us on this show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Network that make this program so successful and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank the listening audience that tune in every month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum, part of the Federal News Network.